This video will introduce the sampling theorem conceptually, and a subsequent video will go through the mathematics involved in deriving it. So quite often we are confronted with a situation that is illustrated by the picture that I have on the screen, and that situation is the following. We have a time waveform, which I've labeled x of t. This might be, um, typically it's a signal from the real world. Uh, so for example, it might be the output of a sensor. It might be music or speech that we've uh, acquired through a microphone and turned into a voltage. But it's some continuous time signal. And what we typically want to do with this is we want to sample it. The benefits of sampling the signal is that we can then represent it in a computer and in the computer we can do all sorts of wonderful things to it. Uh, so that's one application. Another reason why we might want to do this is to be able to store the data. So uh, for example when you think about a music CD you have a real or a signal which is the music you sample that, and for a music CD, that sampling occurs at 44,100 hertz. And those samples are stored on the CD. And then when you play the CD, what you want to do is reconstruct the original signal, the original X of T. So you go from your samples back to the original X of T. The sampling theorem answers the question which is what sample rate do I need to do this? Okay, the idea is that um, clearly if I choose maybe one sample here and another sample here and so on, there's a good chance that I will not be able to reconstruct my signal exactly. We want to reduce the number of samples to the extent that we can because every sample takes up space to, uh, to store or to process. And so the question is, um, how many samples per second do I need to take? And it turns out the answer is, for those of you that are impatient, that my sample frequency, that is the rate, the number of samples per second, has to be greater than twice the bandwidth of the signal. And in just a minute we'll explain what bandwidth is. So again, for those of you that are impatient, this is the answer. Uh, you find the bandwidth of your signal, you double that, and then make sure that your sample frequency is larger than that. And typically in real life you want it to be at least two and a half to three times the bandwidth. So uh, let's uh, give you a brief explanation about why this is the case. And this explanation requires that we look at things in the frequency domain. So if I take my signal x of t and compute its Fourier transform, which I would graph in this case as a magnitude spectrum, um, typically, it's going to look something like this, uh, like some pile of frequencies. And sometimes, actually not very often, but we do stuff to make this happen, um, the signal will go to zero at some frequency, and I've kind of screwed this up, at some frequency which I'll call 2 pi b. So between negative 2 pi b and 2 pi b, um, their, the signal uh, spectrum is non-zero. For values of omega greater than 2 pi b or less than 2 pi b, the signal spectrum is zero. Okay. And uh, again, this doesn't happen that often in real signals, but Typically, you'll filter them to make this happen. When I sample, so again, we'll represent this in the frequency domain. What happens is that I 
have my original spectrum. So let's see, we'll call this perhaps the magnitude spectrum of X sub S to indicate that this is a sampled signal. So my original uh, spectrum of X sub S, this guy up here, basically shows up down here again. And that's nice because that means we can eventually recover it if we need to, which is usually why we sample in the first place. But the interesting thing is that the spectrum also is replicated at different frequencies. So at a frequency that is minus omega s, and omega s in this case would be 2 pi times f sub s, where f sub s is the number of samples per second, I get a copy of x of omega. This uh, guy, not only does he come down here, he ends up here. And at a, a frequency of plus omega s, I get another copy of this spectrum. And um, it turns out this actually happens over and over again. So out here at 2 omega s, I get another copy of the spectrum. And so the idea is that every integer multiple of omega s, I have a copy of the spectrum of x. Now, um, let's do this kind of backwards from the way you typically see this done. The way that I recover this, uh, that I recover x of omega from x of s, if you look at the picture, if I have a low-pass filter that has a transfer function that looks like this, so we've got some omega c, which is the cutoff, and minus omega c, and it goes to a height of 1, if I have a low-pass filter like this, this component of the spectrum, which is the component that I want, uh, comes through the low-pass filter without any change. But um, these components out at omega s and 2 omega s get destroyed. They go away because my low-pass filter has a transfer function of 0 out in these frequencies. So it turns out that I can reconstruct my sampled signal by running it through a, a low-pass filter. This is actually an ideal low-pass filter. But suppose that omega s, let's see, let's get a, suppose that omega s is not large enough that this spectrum and this spectrum are separated. Suppose that omega s is small enough, so suppose that we had an omega s here, so that I get a copy of the spectrum that's centered here at this omega s, and then this would be 2 omega s, and so on. So if omega s is not big enough, then I get these copies of the spectrum, and uh, each copy, if they overlap, essentially add together. So my sum might look something like this, where the parts that overlap get larger. And if that happens, then there's no way I can get a uh, low-pass filter that's going to separate out omega, or x of omega, from this mess because of these overlapping parts. So when I uh, try to uh, reconstruct my signal, uh, my original, uh, let's see, let's get a even uglier color. My original uh, x of omega gets corrupted by all this stuff that's been added in. And I have another chunk out here. So this process of corrupting the signal is called aliasing. And aliasing is obviously bad. So in order for aliasing not to occur, you can see that we need the condition that 2 pi b, or again, b is the bandwidth of the signal,
is less than omega s over 2. Because if I have omega s out here, I need to be able to get this half of the, uh, of the extra spectrum plus this half of the original spectrum that I want into the space without them overlapping. And so uh, this condition here would work. And uh, typically, you'll see this expressed, well, as omega s is greater than 2 times 2 pi b. And quite often, you'll see it expressed not in radial frequency, but in terms of just a frequency. So if I divide both sides by uh, 2 pi, I get f sub s, which is the sampling frequency, is greater than 2b. Okay, so this is the result. Uh, this is the statement of the sampling theorem. And hopefully this messy diagram has given you some understanding of the concepts involved there. And in a subsequent video, we'll go through the mathematics in more detail for those of you that really want to understand it and that are uh, skeptical of my pictures.